All right, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, GDS webinar series. We are uh, pleased to have you here today, uh, this Friday afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are located. Um, this is the webinar number eight. We have had uh, quite a few webinars up to now. It's, uh, you know, we've been doing weekly ones and covering uh, some of the March meeting uh, talks. Today we have a special uh, webinar section uh, with our guest that I will uh, introduce him very briefly. Um, but just to uh, just to briefly mention uh, the talks that we've done so far, they're all recorded and on our YouTube channel. If you looked us up at uh, GDS APS on YouTube or uh, use the hashtag GDS virtual you should be able to uh, find a playlist and uh, watch any of these talks that you perhaps, uh, if you miss. Um, separately, uh, please stay connected with us. We have a strong uh, social media presence. So your platform of choice, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we also have a Slack channel if you like to be more involved with GDS, if you have, uh, if you have uh, ideas that you would like to share with us, uh, please join the Slack channel. You can also find the link to uh, this channel on the chat uh, of the uh, webinar today. Um, and obviously, the, our GDS at APS.org, uh, our official email address, if you uh, want to reach out that way, uh, you can also do that. Um, for today's webinar, uh, I would like to just mention that uh, if you had any questions, uh, feel free to use the question tab. Uh, you should be able to uh, write your questions. If you would like to speak up and uh, talk to the speaker and ask your questions verbally, you can raise your hands and I will be able to unmute you. Um, so this information you should be able to uh, see under uh, the chat box of the webinar. All right, um, so uh, today's webinar uh, is, uh, uh, it, is, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Sergey Kalinin. Uh, and uh, we have a very exciting webinar. Just give me one moment. I would like to locate my notes uh, to introduce Sergey. Uh, I did not think of this technical uh, issue. Just give me one moment, please. All right, so that was, um, that was not terrible. Uh, so, Sergey, uh, Cleaning. I personally know him uh, since a couple of years back. He's been an instrumental uh, member of a topical group on data science, uh, one of the founding members, and uh, uh, we have used his guidance and uh, connections uh, throughout developing uh, our uh, March meeting uh, sessions, as well as just you know, uh, a piece of brain behind uh, how the direction that we've been taking for uh, for the GDS. So I really appreciate his contribution uh, to this uh, newborn community. Uh, Sergey is a distinguished staff member at the Center of, Center for Nanophase Material Science at Oak Ridge National Lab. He received his uh, master's degree from Moscow State University in 1998 and a PhD from the University of uh, Pennsylvania in 2002. His research currently focuses on uh, the applications of big data and AI methods in uh, automatically resolved imaging by scanning uh, transmission electron microscopy and scanning probes uh, for applications including uh, physics discovery and atomic fabrication, as well as uh, mesoscopic, uh, mesoscopic studies uh, of electrochemical, uh, ferroelectric, and transport phenomena via scanning probe microscopy. Um, so with that, and today he would be uh, talking about machine learning beyond uh, correlated me uh, models, uh, an area that I am uh, personally very interested in. And um, 
yeah, I, I would like to uh, open it up, uh, pass it to Sergey at this point, and at the end, uh, again, please feel free to raise your hands if you have any questions, uh, or you can also type them uh, in under the questions tab. All right, Sergey, I'm going to pass the screen sharing to you. Perfect. Uh, does it work? Yep, I can see uh, your screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mohammed, and it's a great pleasure to talk. So it's maybe two months later than it could have happened, but uh, so sometimes uh, uh, life changes in a little bit strange ways. So the topic that I would like to talk about today is uh, some, shall we say, not normal directions in the machine learning that take it outside the basic framework uh, based on the purely correlative models. So uh, this, the work I'm going to talk about uh, was done in collaboration with a large number of uh, staff members and postdocs in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I'm showing only the key staff members involved in this project and uh, there is simply not enough uh, place to show everyone that I worked with over the last uh, uh, almost 20 years. So uh, the topic that uh, I would like to start with is to illustrate to which extent uh, machine learning changed the way we live our everyday life. So for all of you, uh, technologies such as Google, Facebook, Yelp, Netflix, Uber are very deeply familiar. So at this moment, you can arrive to the city where you have never been before, for example, Knoxville, uh, take your Google map and uh, use it to find the place with the best beer. And uh, this uh, sense of connectedness makes us feel that machine learning is omnipresent and uh, extraordinarily powerful. And then the question becomes is that if these technologies like Google and Facebook work so well in everyday life, would they also work in the scientific world? So just as an example, let me illustrate a set of questions that we can ask in the context of material science. For example, uh, the materials that I work with for the while are ferroelectrics and to some extent uh, 2D materials and superconductor. And the first question I can ask, is the material ferroelectric or is the material superconductor? This is a relatively easy question. And if you have a proper tool, either scanning probe microscope or the macroscopic measurement system, you can answer it through the physical measurement. However, after that, you can start to ask more complicated questions. For example, what makes material ferroelectric or superconductor? Or why is material ferroelectric? So these questions target more the intrinsic nature of physics. So what is that special about the arrangements of atoms and their interactions? that will make, give the material the properties that we see. However, then we can ask even more complicated questions. For example, will the material be ferroelectric if I do something to it? So we are going from understanding to being actually able to uh, predict the outcomes on the future actions. And of course, finally, what can I do to make material ferroelectric or superconductor? So we are going the full circle from the establishing the presence of some functionality to point of controlling it through the design and creation of the future material. So this type of questions are absolutely normal in any experimental science domain. So you probably have answered them over and over throughout your graduate, postgraduate and professional life. And then the question becomes, which of those questions can be answered using the machine learning methods? And in this case, I can uh, quote a very famous statement by the Freeman Dyson who said that the new directions are launched by the new tools much more often than by the new concept. So notice that there is still disagreement about it. There are a lot of people who think that Thomas Kuhn's statement about the uh, concepts being all important is kind of uh, the right way to approach science. But Dyson noticed that practically tools lead to new science much more often than the concept needs to new science. So concept can be well, well ahead of its time and then there is no way to realize it. And then the question becomes, so machine learning now is a tool. 
unlike the previous periods of the machine learning, which followed by the uh, AI winters, now you can download the Pyro or GPTorch or uh, TensorFlow. You can implement in the uh, Jupyter Notebook on the Google Colab. So the machine learning is available to everyday scientists. Question becomes, does it mean that the machine learning can fundamentally change this way we are doing science? And what's very interesting and a little bit humbling that if you look at the way how science is done now and science done 20 years ago, this is pretty much the same situation. So the tools that we are using, word origin, uh, whatever, uh, are pretty much this ISI searches. They're pretty much the same as they were 20 years ago. However, everyday life changed completely because of Google, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So the question becomes, can these tools enter the scientific domain? And in my particular case, I'm interested in the discovery and the investigation of the new material. So how, how can we do it? Well, one way we can think about the material is the collection of atoms that exist in the real space. Obviously, we are not interested in all the possible configurations. We are interested only in those that correspond to the minima corresponding to the metastable composition. So this is so-called the chemical space of the system. So all materials and molecules are the points in this chemical space. And therefore, finding the right material becomes a search problem. And we know that machine learning is great at search, correct? Well, uh, not so fast. So those of you who are familiar with the machine learning knows that one of the fundamental aspects of the machine learning is training the network through the backpropagation. The key requirement for the backpropagation is the function to be differentiable. Otherwise, you simply cannot backpropagate your machine learning training. So guess what? Chemical space of the systems is not differentiable. You cannot smoothly go from one compound to another compound. Second part of the machine learning is the uh, loss function. So this is something that you minimize due to the backpropagation. So the presence of the loss function means that you should be able to calculate something. So and the number of things that we can calculate is actually also relatively small. We can calculate band gaps and Jung's modulus, but we really cannot calculate things like biological activities or superconductivity. That's the second problem. Third problem is that machine learning typically deals with the average behaviors of the system. However, when we deal with the materials, we typically want to find the best material for application. We want to find the outlier. Machine learning is not terribly good for it, which basically means that yes, machine learning are the great technologies, they're useful in many regards. However, if we want to use them for solve the real problem, world material problems, Neither our space is differentiable, nor our cost function is known, nor machine learning is strictly speaking suitable to do what we want to do. So the question becomes, do we get something in exchange? And the answer is yes, we do. Because we know that the physics is predicated on the existence of the underlying physical laws that determine what is possible and what is not possible. And these laws are generally universal and uh, we can expect them to be simple, if not necessarily known. So the question becomes, can we target the machine learning towards understanding of these physical laws? Now, before we go there, let me just give you a little bit of idea why we cannot just search through the material space. So for example, if we talk about molecular systems, the size of the chemical space, if you look at Wikipedia, would be something like 10 to the power of 63. And then of course, the caveat is, is true, for the system that has done less than 30 atoms. That said, the small molecules is something where machine learning actually works because this is close to what can be handled with the modern computational power. So we can optimize the edges, the reactions individually. It is amenable to the literature mining through the programs like Chematica. The size of this chemical space can be grown through the known reactions like retrosynthesis. And the rate of discovery can be accelerated through the things like laboratory robotics. So for a relatively small amount of money, you can ramp up your lab output by a factor of thousand. You still don't necessarily know the functionalities, but you know, theory does wonderful things these days. For solid material, situation is more complicated. So in principle, we can try to describe the solids as the collection of individual molecular fragments. For example, like Stephen Cortarola did 
for the analysis of the superconductive behavior. But if we look through the history of the superconductivity, we can see that the discovery was always going in the kind of bursts. So, for example, uh, copper superconductors were discovered in uh, uh, late 80s, and immediately there was a huge volume of research of finding similar materials. So, in the proximity of the, uh, of the chemical space to copper HTSCs, there are a lot of other materials based on copper, based on mercury, and so on. However, when the magnesium diboride was discovered in early 2000, it was a single compound. There was no other compounds like that. When RM nictides were discovered 10 years later, again, there was a whole family. So it turns out that we cannot predict superconductivity very well. Therefore, we cannot search the space of the chemical fragments. Uh, another example is this phase diagram for the uh, magnesium uh, intermetallics. So just imagine being able to discover all these compounds just by the grid search. So we would be very quickly swamped under the size of the uh, chemical space. So the question becomes, what can we do? And the answer is that, of course, physics and material science are very, very successful sciences. And the reason why they got to be successful is they found a way to describe the solid materials using the mean field descriptors such as symmetry, concentrations, or the parameters, thermodynamic potentials. So in some sense, if we want to understand the solid compounds, we say that the one unit cell or average unit cell would be representative of the property of the whole material. Naturally, that works many times, but not always. And it turns out that some of the most interesting materials, such as ferroelectric relaxers, Kitaev materials for quantum computing, they don't follow this mean field picture. So for example, this is a picture of the uh, electron microscopy image of the ferroelectric relaxer. So each pixel here is a unit cell and the color of the picture of the pixel is the unit cell volume. So you can clearly see that, that on the atomic level, we see some type of ordering. We see the stripes over here, we see some grainy structures, but that's absolutely not uniform state with the translational invariance that we read about in the textbook. So the question becomes, how can we discuss and understand materials beyond the symmetry-based methods? How can we define the structure-property relationship? And how can we use this information for prediction of the properties? So first of all, we need a tool. And the ideal tool in this regard is a scanning probe microscopy, such as STM or non-contact AFM, and especially electron microscopy. So the nice thing about these techniques is that uh, somehow, in the last uh, 20 years, they transformed from being just an imaging tool that gives us the pictures of atoms to being a quantitative tool. For example, with the electron microscope, we can measure the positions of two atoms in graphene down to about the picometer, which means that if you are an organic chemist and someone tells you the carbon-carbon bond distance, you would be able to say whether this is a alkene or alkene and learn something about the chemical reactivity of this material. If you're a physicist and someone tells you the length of the metal oxygen metal bond and the angle, you would be able to say whether this is a ferromagnet or antiferromagnet or metal or dielectric. Traditionally, this type of measurements were taken by the scattering methods. But for the last 10 years, we can take similar measurements using the microscopy measures, meaning that we get this information about all the atoms in the solid. And the question becomes, what are we going to do with it, right? If I tell you where all the oxygen atoms are in the room, that may be not necessarily the data that you need. You kind of want to know how warm it is and whether there is whether it is comfortable. So too much data is not necessarily good. So uh, interesting thing that, of course, electron microscopy gives much more than that. So in the last uh, 10 years, there was an explosion of applications of electron microscopy for things like single atom imaging, tychography, development of the beam with orbital momentum. So the modern electron microscope is really a very powerful tool that provides a wealth of the quantitative or at least high veracity information about the solid. And the question becomes, what are going to do with this information? So in my case, I'm not a microscopist. I'm a person who works, or at least uh, by background, I'm scanning probe microscopist. And uh, I worked on application of the big data in scanning probe microscopy for quite a while. 
But the question that I'm interested in now is what we can learn from the electron microscopy data using the big data and artificial intelligence methods. And that leads me to the issue of what kind of methods do we need in the first place? So let's look at it from the slightly uh, philosophical point of view. So what is that that we want to get out of the microscopy data set? The answer is that we always think about the microscope as the system that gives us images. And the images are not universal, right? So if I have an image of one material and the image of another material, how am I going to compare it beyond some general features? So the first step that I want to accomplish is actually take our data from the microscope and convert it to the material specific information. For example, atomic coordinates or scattering potentials and so on. So the information which does not depend on the microscope. In fact, the only thing that I want to have from the microscope is the uncertainties. So if I have atomic positions, what are the error bars associated with these positions? Second point is that if I have the information of all or at least big subset of atoms in the solid, then how can I learn the physics and chemistry out of this data? And uh, either through correlative models or through the generative physics models. Finally, if I have this uh, information, can I uh, use it to reconstruct and predict materials behavior? For example, phase diagrams, uh, temperature dependent behavior, and so on. Now, notice that of all these three points, the first one is actually being done by the microscopy community and it's being done very well. The third one, this is what the theorists are doing and uh, they also do it very well. The part which is largely missing is the part of what material specific information in terms of correlative models or generative physics models can we learn from the images. And this is the area where I believe machine learning can provide a, a significant impact and the nice thing about machine learning that if we do it, we probably would be able to do it not only after the data is collected, but also during the time when the data is being collected. So we can use it to engender the real-time feedback to the microscope. Now, this is the plan. So let me show you the example of what I'm talking about in a kind of more visual form. So what you see on the slide is the uh, image of the uh, monolayer of layer transition metal halogenide, molybdenum sulfide, which is being visualized in the electron microscope. So the blobs here are atoms. These are either molybdenum atoms or the uh, two sulfur atoms. You can see the number of vacancies. So the missing uh, sulfur atoms look like dark spots. So it looks great. Now imagine that I keep looking at this microscope, at this sample in the microscope for a few minutes. So what you see is happening is that materials start to fall apart under the action of the electron beam. And from the point of view of the electron microscopist, this is a bad thing. We just deal with the unstable uh, material where we see a big degradation. So therefore, what we need is either reduce the dose or reduce the voltage of our probe to kind of minimize the damage. But look at it from a slightly different perspective. So imagine that you are a solid state chemist. So from the solid state chemist or material science perspective, what happens here is that the electron beam, almost by magic, kicks out the sulfur atoms from the solid. And uh, why it is happening, the material is effectively reduced. And what you see is the chemical reaction when you form the reduced, uh, reduced molybdenum sulfide. So you see everything on the atomic level. You see how the point defects form. You see how the point defect aggregates into the extended defects. And finally, you see the nucleation of the new phase. So you literally see the chemical process on the atomic level. If you look at it from the physicist world uh, viewpoint, it can be a little bit different. So you see collection of uh, objects that are interacting through some force fields. And the questions you can ask is, can you recover these force fields from the observations? So question is how we are going to do about it. And this is the part where machine learning is a tool. So the, because the first thing what you need to do is to take this image and convert it into the coordinates and trajectories of all the atoms here. It's really not a simple task. So we've been doing it for quite a while and it always required some human intervention and 
you really cannot analyze thousand images like that. Until about four years ago, Maxim, uh, who was uh, my postdoc at that time, came and said, look, uh, there is this new thing, deep learning, appearing. How about I spend some time learning, figuring out how to use it? So I said, okay, and then he disappeared for half a year. And then he came and said, look, I figure out how to use the uh, Keras with the TensorFlow backend, which is really a big accomplishment because now there are great textbooks which allow you to kind of learn how to do it in a month. At that time, there was only Chalet book, so this was much more complicated. But then he said, look, I download the uh, train network from the internet. I can uh, take a picture of my dog, send it to this network, and the network will identify what the dog is and predictions would be very close to what the dog actually is. That was very impressive. So we took a picture of the atoms and the tungsten sulfide, send it to the same network, and then the network said, well, maybe it is wool, maybe it is velvet, maybe it is window screen. So why did it happen? It happened because a lot of people spend a lot of time labeling dogs and cats on the internet. So I don't understand their motivation, but nonetheless, for machine learning, there is a large amount of labeled data sets of dogs. In the case of uh, atoms, people just didn't do it much. And therefore, the network doesn't have the label data they can train upon. There are other reasons, uh, like a heavy degenerate of the feature space and so on, but this is where you can start. So we spend considerable amount of time to learn how to train the networks for finding atoms. It turns out that this uh, training has to be closely tied with the way microscope behaves and operates. But once it is done, it really starts to work like a charm. So this is the example of the data coming from the microscope. So what you see here is the graphene sheet. You can barely see the atoms. There is a hole in the center of the graphene sheet. And then there are bright spots are the silicon atom that dance on the edges of this hole. And the network can take this data stream and convert it to what you see on the right, which is the red are carbon atoms and green are silicon atoms. It works really, really well, much better than the human eye. And uh, what it allows us to do is to take the data stream from the microscope and uh, convert it into the atomic coordinates. So this is our technical step. And then we can do other things with it. For example, we can collect these movies for uh, several tens of minutes to the tune of several hundreds of frames. And then we can create a library of the defects that exist in the solid. We can share these defect configurations with uh, our theory colleagues so they can calculate the electronic properties. We can even try to take the STM image of the same material, even though this is type of experiment that you should do only once because uh, it takes forever. And of course, in the kind of data should be open. so. Uh, these data sets and this uh, code for doing it are fully available as the part of the uh, Atom AI and Citrin platform. So if you're interested, this is something that you can do. We can use the same approach for more complex materials. For example, we can create libraries of the structural distortions as opposed to atomic configurations. Uh, we can do more complex things. For example, one of the very fascinating uh, technologies in machine learning is uh, cycle consistent generative net adversarial networks, uh, CCGANs, that allow you to take a picture of the horse and make it in the zebra and vice versa. So it turns out that uh, the same approach can be used to convert the data from one theoretical representation and another theoretical representation. For example, we can calculate a fairly complex uh, seabed pattern, the many body scattering, and we can use the CGANs in order to go from the uh, structure to this uh, images and vice versa. Of course, it becomes kind of complicated. The GANs are remarkably difficult to train and are very hungry for computational resources, but it works. But then the question becomes, is it really the powerful tool that can do everything? Or is it something that as a scientist we should be using but always check and double check ourselves? And let me illustrate one very simple example, which is so-called Simpson paradox. So this is a picture which shows the dependence between the correlation between the exercise and cholesterol. And you can see that the more people exercise, the more cholesterol they have. 
that feels a little bit strange, right? Because uh, for those of you who are already concerned about it, your doctor always tells you that uh, you should exercise to reduce your cholesterol. And somehow this diagram looks exactly opposite. And uh, it turns out that there are other things which are kind of strange because, for example, you can find some drugs which are known to be bad for men and bad for women, but they are good for people in general. So how is it even possible? And the answer is that is that correlations can be very powerful, but they can also be very misleading. So, for example, uh, for this cholesterol problem, uh, the understanding will become obvious if you start to split your data into the groups depending on ages. You can see that for each age group, cholesterol exercise is actually good to color for cholesterol. However, the older you become, the less efficient this process becomes. So in the higher age group, no matter how much you exercise, your cholesterol would be still higher. And what's interesting is that people actually try to exercise more when they're older, and the combination of these three factors gives you this uh, false behavior. So this is uh, not limited to cholesterol and exercise. There are many other examples like that. So for example, uh, Judy Pearl and his uh, excellent book, Causality Lists and other examples, uh, there is a very good correlation between the amount of the chocolate people consume per capita and the rate at which countries win Nobel Prizes. But it really doesn't mean that if you feed people chocolate by force, they're going to win Nobel Prizes. It doesn't work this way. So the reason why it is happening is because correlation is not causation. You have to deal with the common sources or confounders or observational biases. And the thing that is really, really important is that this type of problems have nothing to do with how, with what machine learning algorithm you are using. So if you use the simple regression or very complicated deep learning network, it is not going to change this erroneous interpretation of correlative data set. In fact, with the regression, you have a chance to kind of check it by yourself. The deep learning networks, which are much more complicated, are much more likely to mislead you because you always trust the complex uh, algorithm more than the simple explanation. So the question becomes, when can we use the AI and machine learning in physics in general? And the answer is that, uh, it may be slightly speculative, but after thinking about it for quite a while, we came to the conclusion that machine learning works extraordinarily well if the causal link is well known and defined. So if the cause and effect in our physical mechanism are known, then the machine learning can work as extremely powerful interpolator and allow us to go forward and backward. And in fact, most machine learning applications in theory belong to this class. If the causal link is known and there are some confounders or observational biases, but they are frozen, machine learning will still work because the unknown factors that can affect our measurements, they don't change much. So it still works pretty well. But if the causal links are multiple and unknown, then there would be dragons. Machine learning can be absolutely give you absolutely wrong answers. The question becomes, what can we do about it? And the answer is that uh, there are, in principle, multiple areas of science where people have uh, cannot do experiments. Uh, for example, astronomy. Astronomers don't experiment, uh, thankfully. Uh, but uh, they can derive a very complex models from the observations only. So what it means is that uh, the problems can be untractable in terms of combinatorics or have unclear causative chain, but have a very simple constitutive loss. Another example that I can show you is the very famous Mandelbrot set. In fact, uh, to some extent, my fascination with the physics started at the first year in chemistry department when my uh, design project was on applications of fractals and solid state chemistry. And uh, as you can see on the structure of the Mandelbrot set, it's very complicated. It has the details on all levels of resolution. So trying to compress it in terms of statistical representation is going to be hopeless. There are too much details. However, in terms of the algorithmic complexity, it's very simple. The point in the Mandelbrot set can be constructed as a result of the simple recursion. 
So something that is very complex in terms of real world structure has a very simple algorithmic law behind it. Question becomes, can we use machine learning to find those laws? And it seems that now there are three primary directions in which machine learning can go to get outside of the pure correlation model. So one is you know, using the fact that physics is parsimonious. So in this case, we are looking for the specific interactions or parameters of lightest Hamiltonian or whatever. Second is the causality, and I'll show what it is in a few minutes. And the third is the Bayesian approach, which is using the past knowledge. So let's look at several examples of all of the three. So let's start with the uh, parsimony of the physics law. So as I mentioned, I really like the ferroelectric materials because this is something I've studied for quite a while. And many of you have seen the simple diagram of what the ferroelectric is. So you have a material in the paraelectric state when it is cubic. You have a material in the ferroelectric state, which is tetragonal. There is this mysterious reaction coordinate that connects them. So the vertical axis is energy, that's simple. And what configuration con uh, coordinate means is that all the molecule, all the unit cell in the solid will march in the lockstep. So if, even if there is a 10 to the 23 degrees uh, of, the, of them. So this description in terms of uh, configuration coordinates, collective variables, or the parameters is absolutely universal. People do it at solid state physics, material science and biology and so on and so forth. So if we do it on a little bit more deeper level, then rather than showing the simple, so kind of going from the first year undergraduate to the last years in undergraduate, now we deal with the um, uh, with the functional, free energy functional, that describes the relationship between the free energy density and the order parameter. This is a basis for so-called phase field theories, and it works extraordinarily well. The only problem is that if you want to solve the problem with the integral functional, you need to know what happens in the boundaries. And that's a problem because you cannot get it self-consistently. So about 10 years ago, when we started to think about this type of problems, we have shown that we actually can use the atomically resolved data to derive the unknown values for these uh, functionals. For example, the boundary conditions at surfaces or interfaces. So the pathway in this case is very simple. We just have the free energy. We calculate the solution, for example, for order parameter across the interface. This solution will have uh, some constants, which we normally don't know. So we just kind of have to have an unknown parameter. However, if we take the atomically resolved data and we fit the atomic distortions that we see in electron microscope, to our macroscopic solution, we can derive the value of this constants. This approach can be taken much further. So this is an example of the ferroelectric vortices uh, observed by the uh, Berkeley group. So they look at the ferroelectric light titanate and because of the screening, light titanate forms the um, vortex-like ordering of the polarization vectors. So, it turns out that the shape of the vortex is strongly related to the strength of the flux electric coupling inside the material. And flux electricity is one of the things that is uh, very important on the nanoscale, but very difficult to measure microscopically because it tends to hide behind the electrochemical phenomena. So it turns out that if we use machine learning method to extract the average shape of the vortex and then uh, mesh it to theory, we can get a very good estimate for the flex electric constant tensor. So it feels great. Then the question becomes, don't we kind of do a lot of extra work? So we have uh, atomistic models and atomistic studies. We try to feed them to the mesoscale theory. So is that even the right way to go? And let's look at a little bit bigger picture of how the physics of the condensed matter system works in general. So on the one end of the spectrum, we will have uh, theorists who work on the microscopic models, Ising, Heisenberg, Taif, sort of, if we talk about Hamiltonians and so on. Typically, once you have the microscopic models, you use them to calculate the macroscopic observables, like properties, structure, fluctuations, and so on. On the other end of spectrum, you have the experimentalists who make materials and they do the macroscopic measurements. And then we try to match the macroscopic theory predictions and macroscopic measurements. So 
only three years ago, notice that it was just three years ago when Roger Melka and Perimeter Institute shown that you can use the machine learning method to compress the information to get the macroscopic observables. So that was impressive. And then we asked ourselves a question, but can we just use machine learning to directly match the microscopic model and microscopic observable that we get from the electron microscope or scanning probe microscope? So since I'm not a theorist and uh, you're kind of always limited by type of theory and models that you have access to. The simplest model that one can work with is Ising model. It's kind of very, very simple. All of you have seen it. Uh, and uh, look at the phase diagram of the Ising model. When we look at the ground state of the system at the function of temperature, which is horizontal axis, and the exchange integral, which is the vertical axis. So for low temperatures and the positive exchange integral, you see ferromagnetic state. For negative exchange integral, you see antiferromagnetic states like checkerboard. For high temperatures, you see the disordered states. So basically, by looking at the ground state of the Ising model, we can say roughly what part of the phase diagram we are in. So the question becomes, can we do it in a little bit more mathematically? The answer is yes, we can do it. There is a method called the statistical distance minimization developed by Lucas Vilsack quite a while ago. And basically what this method means is that if I am given the generative model and I am given the snapshot of a system at unknown temperature, I would be able to reconstruct for sorry, unknown value of exchange integral, I would be able to reconstruct the strength of this coupling. What's very interesting and very important from the scientific point of view is that this method works very well above the phase transition temperature. Uh, this matters because uh, most of the microscopes in the world are either room temperature or nitrogen. There are very few liquid helium microscopes. So if, I'm, if I can measure the physical behavior, the temperature is well above the phase transition, I simply have more opportunities to do so. Of course, this doesn't come without the price. For example, we can do the uncertainty quantification and we show that the higher the temperature, the less reliable is your method, but that's kind of expected. There is no free lunches. What is really good is that this prediction is unbiased, meaning that if we have sufficient statistics, we still can learn the true physics of the system. Does it work experimentally? Well, this is the example. So this is a, a solid solution of molybdenum sulfide and rhenium sulfate. So if you have a very little bit of rhenium, you can see individual rhenium atoms, they're bright. If you start and the system is, uh, uh, you can see a clear uh, ordered uh, six-fold lattice. If you start to increase the amount of rhenium in the system, you start to see that uh, the number of bright atoms goes up. And you also start to see this kind of crisscrossing lines, which is the signature of the first order phase transition. So uh, if you take these images and do the Fourier transform, you can see the sort of what you expect for the first order phase transition. That pure phase, you have a sharp single peaks, then peaks start to split and broad. So broadening is the disorder, splitting is the phase transition. And then if you keep doing it, then the peaks become narrow again, but they already split. So your phase transition, you're out of the phase transition region into the new phase. The question becomes is that if our theory worked for idealizing model, will it work for experimental data? The answer is yes, it will be. So I can imagine that for a second I forget about physics and just take the atomic coordinates of the rhenium and molybdenum atom. So I can take this statistics for this uh, composition series, uh, put it in this uh, statistical distance minimization model, and I can recover the uh, two-parameter interaction between the rhenium atoms. So I can either parameterize it as the nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors. I can parameterize it as uh, two-body models. But in both cases, I get the answer that the rhenium atoms are weakly repulsive. And notice what it means. It means that I've taken a set of observations of the system at the very different levels of doping. Uh, this data has a lot of information in terms of the atomic configurations. 
I was able to take this data and compress it just to two numbers that determine the interaction between the rhenium atoms. I built the generative physical model. And based on this model, I can do everything. I can reconstruct the phase diagram. I can reconstruct the any number of the representation of microstructure and the intermediate concentrations. I can do everything. Of course, the question becomes, how much can I trust it? And the answer is probably between these compositions and maybe a little bit outside, but it's not clear how far outside. But still, it is much more reliable than any kind of prediction based on the correlative model. They just don't work this way. I can also make the next step, which is that I can measure the distortions of the lattice around this each atom and start to analyze these distortion patterns as the function of the local chemical composition. So macroscopically, our material has, we have only four uh, compositions, but locally we have a fluctuations of concentration. And we can see how the symmetry breaking happens at the level of one atom. So if we do it and kind of go through all the mathematics, which is not particularly difficult but tedious, we can see that the symmetry breaking happens when we have between one and two rhenium neighbors. So for zero, one, the local lattice does not undergo the symmetry breaking distortion. But if we go for two or more, we start to have it, and that seems to be independent on the global concentration. So traditionally, we probe symmetry breaking globally. Now we can do it locally. So what about other things? So I mentioned that I'm going to briefly introduce you to the biogenity, and let me illustrate what it is. So again, let's go back to the ferroelectric materials. Ferroelectric material has an order parameter, which is polarization. And it turns out that uh, for scalar, sorry, for vector order parameter, we can have three types of domain walls. The Ising wall, when the polarization goes down, disappears and then reappears with the opposite sign. Block wall, when it rotates in plane. And nail wall, when it rotates uh, as shown on this uh, image. It turns out that the structure of the domain wall is uh, naturally linked to the type of phase transition in ferroelectric and the structure of the other parameter. So for the first order phase transition, we have the Ising wall. For the multi-axial ferroelectric, we have uh, we can have the Niel wall. And the shape of the Ising wall would be different depending on whether the material has a first or second order phase transition. And interestingly now, that is something that people knew for about uh, 60 years by now. However, what people didn't know is that they didn't have the tools for measuring the atomic structures. And now with the scanning transmission electron microscopy, we have. So the question that we can start to answer now is, can we determine the parameters of the material from experimental data? And this sounds very easy. We just take this equation and fit it to the observations. But then you can ask a second question, how reliably? Second question is, can we distinguish the different wall models from observation? For example, if we look at the domain wall profile, can we say whether this is Ising or the Niel wall and how reliably? And then we can start to ask even more interesting questions. For example, if I know that my data is not enough to distinguish these two physical models, can I say what kind of microscope do I need to get the sufficiently good data? So should I go to my manager and say, how about we invest $5 million in the next microscope because it will be able to do it? Or realistically, we can expect the microscopes that can do it appear in the next 30 years. So how do we answer this type of questions? And even more interesting question is, imagine that we have two people looking at these ferroelectric domain walls. One person knows the physics of ferroelectric materials and the other person does not. So can the prior knowledge help us to answer the questions about the physics of this walls from observations. And uh, again, uh, the example of the system that I, we explored here is this combinatorial library of the bithnes ferrite. So it's very convenient sample where on the one hand we have a doped bithnes ferrite, which is paraelectric and orthorhombic. On the other hand, we have a pure material. Pure material has a nice ferroelectric domain wall, so we can use it for our studies. And uh, a kind of good example of uh, this approach to life is a statement uh, by Donald Rumsfeld, kind of very smart statement, that uh, there are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. And 
for a politician or military person, the unknown unknowns are the, diff are the dangerous one. So as it happens, uh, my wife is a uh, Persian, and one thing that you learn when you interact with the Persians is that all the uh, things were originally discovered in uh, present-day Iran and Iraq uh, about a thousand years ago. It's actually kind of very, seems to be very close to reality, and in particular, there was a poem by Nasser al-Din Tusi who said basically the same thing as Donald Rumsfeld, except using the realities of the uh, 12th century. However, it turns out that there is a fourth type of uh, unknowns, which is the uh, unknown knowns. And this unknown knowns is exactly what is covered by the Bayesian theorem. So if we want to learn something new given the data, what we need to know is the data given the theory, so the forward models. We need to have some idea about the, how likely is the theory. This is our expertise. And uh, we need the ways to combine it all together in one computation platform. So that typically requires uh, computers. So typically, Bayesian statistics was perceived to be something very, very complicated. And there are historical reasons for that. But uh, one very important thing is that for if you're an experimentalist, the Bayesian thinking is the natural way to think about your data. We always think how our data change our perception of the outside world, and we rely on our past knowledge to kind of estimate how it goes on. The only problem is that by far and large, we don't know how to convert it from what is called the domain experience into the mathematical form. Compared to that, frequency-based statistics have a lot of issues which uh, we are not going to talk about, but they're pretty serious. Nonetheless, how can we use the Bayesian statistics uh, to work with this data set? So we don't have much time, so I'm just going to show you an illustration of what we learn. We take our domain wall profile. We start with some prior knowledge about the materials in terms of distribution of parameters. And then we calculate the posterior distributions. So given the experiment, what is that that we learn about the material? So we get this nice distributions, which basically tells us what the physics of material is. More importantly, we can answer the questions about how good a microscope I, do I need to distinguish the different models for the ferroelectric behavior. For example, what is shown on this slide is the diagrams that uh, calculate the distinguishability of physical models for first and second order ferroelectric if we, as a function of noise and the sampling. So basically, this is what our microscope will give us. So if uh, the region is black, that means that we can distinguish the physical models. And if the region is green, then we cannot. So as you can see, if I go from, uh, this is the case when I don't know anything about the material, I just try the, my, trust my microscope. You can see that this is the region where I can learn the physics. Now imagine that I know much more about the physics of my material, so I can constrain the priors on my analysis. All of a sudden, I can do this measurements and uh, learn the physics at higher noise and lower sampling. So my prior knowledge allows me to answer my fundamental questions, even if my microscope is not operating so well. There is a price, however. The improvement of the analysis upon the reliable knowledge is relatively small. I mean, it's not really small. It's still kind of half order of magnitude. And in electron microscopy, if you can push the resolution by 30%, you can publish paper in science. So it's not a small thing. Uh, the cost in terms of money and effort for any 10% of improvement is rather astronomical. However, the price for it is that if your knowledge is incorrect, for example, I take the definitely wrong prior, then all the advantage goes away. I simply cannot learn physics. So it's a little bit ironic that if you know physics well, you can do things slightly better. But if you are certain in the wrong knowledge, uh, then things just don't work at all. Now, the final thing that, or almost final thing that I want to illustrate very briefly is the causality and what it is and why do we care? So I talked briefly about the generative laws, and I said that if we understand the laws, we understand the physical system. It is not exactly true. So look at this picture, which shows the 
uh, dependence between the volume and pressure for the ideal gas. So let's ask a question. Does the volume cause the pressure or the pressure cause the volume? And this question doesn't have an answer, right? So there is only one value of pressure or one value of volume. We cannot say which one is cause, which one is the effect. However, if we consider the realistic process, for example, in process one, you can clearly see that the change in pressure causes the change in volume. In the process two, the change in volume causes the change in pressure. Process one and two become the same in the thermodynamic limit when it is infinitely small. But in the real, so in the thermodynamic limit, we don't have a causality. Things are just relationships. But in the real world, we need to kind of think about it. Is it relevant for physics or material science? The answer is in simple systems, no. Simple systems can be described by sort of one relationship. But there are plenty of examples of materials where if you dig a little bit deeper, the relationship between the cause and effect becomes not obvious. For example, in the ferroelectric materials close to the morphotropic phase boundary, I can say that I generally assume that the cationic order is frozen and polarization field then accommodates this uh, cationic disorder. But I also know that ions can move to compensate polarization. So there are things like segregation of the domain walls, memory effects, and so on. So in the real material, I don't know whether it is the uh, polarization aligned to the frozen cationic disorder, or does the polarization instability drive the cationic disorder? And knowing this is actually pretty important because it affects my strategy for designing materials with the interesting properties. So how am I going to answer this question? The answer is, I don't know. It's one of the directions that would be very interesting. There are uh, probably uh, millions of people now who work on machine learning. There are only three or four groups in the world that work on the causal machine learning. So we started to play with some simple pairwise uh, causal models, and they already started to produce some interesting answers about what is the cause and what is the effect in those materials. Obviously, the next development for this will be trying to marry the Bayesian models and the causal models to look for the surprise in the data. So to find places where what are the physical laws on average and the places where these physical laws are violated. Now, the last thing that I want to very briefly touch upon is uh, whether the Bayesian methods can help us to guide experiment. And uh, to understand the motivation here, let me just show you the same picture of this combinatorial library of bismuth ferrite. And, you know, let's assume that I can do the electron microscopy measurements, right? So it actually takes a lot of time. So my colleagues have to do the FIB milling, make a good sample, look at it on the microscope, analyze the results. It weeks. So imagine that I've done measurements in two locations or three locations. How do I pick the place for the fourth location? Notice that it's not necessarily limited to microscopy. It can apply for chemical synthesis or it can apply for anything else. So how do you choose the place where to do the measurements? And of course, it's not limited for this particular sample in this particular microscope. Uh, there are many microscopes in the world, and uh, most of the time microscopes sit in the dark rooms and try to tune them and get the, find the interesting places. So can we do it better? And it turns out that Bayesian methods open, offer a natural framework for doing it. So since for the last uh, months and a half, Virtually all of us were confined at home and uh, kind of with a lot of time to concentrate on important things. So this is the example of how I can take the Bayesian-based process and use the lack of knowledge or surprise about the system to find the interesting regions. Here I do it for the uh, Ising uh, model. So I use the Bayesian optimization process to find the regions in the uh, Ising model that have high heat capacity. So the red points are my initial measurements, the green points which I discover one by one. And you can see that uh, after spending about uh, two days, I can write an algorithm that finds the heat capacity and takes the measurements only in the interesting regions. So the same approach works for two-dimensional spaces. So I can explore the two-dimensional space of Ising model and initially I just take measurements everywhere. By the end of the process, I will converge in the regions where the phase transitions happen. So that works in theory. We start to deploy this on the microscopes. So the idea here is that you need to kind of teach the microscope to scan in the non-rectangular scan. So fortunately, 
at Oakridge, we learned how to do it quite a while ago. This is one of our first papers when we told the AFM to scan across the non-rectangular scanning. And then the question can become, you can ask a question, for which applications will this be useful? So for studying physics on the mesoscale, definitely. Studying physics on the atomic level, maybe. But the application where it can make a huge impact is studying the chemistry. So chemistry, in some sense, is more difficult to study than physics because in physics, we, uh, it's relatively oh, easy to come. Uh, we have four minutes left. Oh, uh, yep, almost done. We can come up with the good descriptors. However, in chemistry, descriptors are more complicated. So we need to think about the graphs, about the equivalent representations, and so on and so forth. However, the real price here is that if we learn to control the chemistry by the electron beam, we can do great things. For example, this is the case when we use the electron beam to make the silicon atom move in circles. This is an example where we made it work in the straight line because you are not going to get far if you go in circles. And then in both cases, this took quite a lot of time. So it took a, a very qualified operator about a day to make it happen. We know that if you spend enough time, you can even assemble the atomic structures out of it, like dimers, trimers, and so on. We can even make the heteroatomic molecules. The question is, can we use the machine learning in order to automate this process and build the structures automatically? And I think that this is something that we are going to find out in the future. So thank you very much for your attention. So this is the summary. So data matters, but I believe that only physics and chemistry are analyzed. Machine learning is a great tool, but it's really not enough if you want to do physics. And the directions to explore would be the uh, parsimony, causality, and biogenity. And there are great things that you can do with the microscopes. So thank you for your attention, and uh, it would be great to stay in touch. Thank you very much. Uh, a great presentation. I truly enjoyed it. Um, let's see if there are any questions. Again, feel free to uh, raise your hands or uh, you can also use the question box. While you're waiting, I just have a general question, uh, Sergey. Uh, you know, about five years ago, perhaps, uh, and still up to an extent today, there, there, there are people who are skeptical about machine learning in physics and especially in physics discovery. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of it has gone away, and as you mentioned, uh, where do you see we are headed uh, in the upcoming years? And uh, what kind of uh, advice do you have? Uh, do you have for younger physicists? Uh, it's a great physicists? question. So, first of all, let me say that people who are skeptical about the machine learning in uh, physics are absolutely correct. So, I started to do the machine learning in physics uh, uh, big time, uh, and uh, it is absolutely true that from the very beginning it was, uh, do you see my screen? Yes. So it is absolutely true that from the very beginning you can feel that a lot of people in the classical physics community are very uneasy about the machine learning. And the reason for that is exactly the fact that correlation is not a causation. Physics wants to explore causation and machine learning explores the correlation. So. Part of the reason why we have come up with these ideas about the parsimony and so on, and part of the reason why the machine learning community now explores things like the symmetry group and invariant networks, Hamiltonian networks, whatever, is because we need to find the ways to merge physics and machine learning concept. So there are ways to do it. However, there is a catch. If you want to, so one thing that I may be wrong, but my observation over a long time was that data scientists and machine learning experts are not generally going to learn physics. So they have enough interesting things to do as as they are. However, if you're a physicist and you want to learn the machine learning, interestingly enough, for the first year, you just need to forget about physics and learn the classical machine learning tools. And only when your coding skills and understanding of the classical tools is not physics-based tools is sufficiently high, then you can start to combine the physics and machine learning concepts and then the life becomes really exciting but you have to pay the dues in terms of the learning machine learning 
that that makes sense and uh, i think we are all also aware that the physics community has been a little bit lagging behind uh, in general compared to some other communities uh you know when it comes to data science and i think sergey you're one of the uh, uh pioneers of uh this uh, i would say in the physics community and i was about last year you sent me your collab uh paper I was very impressed by by that and i think uh it certainly that kind of approach helps the reproducibility of research and uh speeding up the research in general um so let's see we are almost out of time but if there's uh if there are any questions uh please let me know i also would like to mention that uh, on top of everything impressive about sergey uh his uh impressive citations uh Know, plus 32,000 and large number of published papers. He's a uh, Persian, uh, not only conversationally fluent, but also uh, Sergei is very interested in reading poetry uh, in Persian as well as news. Uh, I've been, I'm also a Persian, and I've been uh, very impressed by that. That's how, that's how we know each other. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, just one last thing, uh, I would like to make a very brief announcement about our upcoming uh, webinar next week, basically uh, next Friday. You would also receive an email. Uh, let me see. Can you can you see my screen, Sergey? Yes. All right, perfect. Uh, so you're also going to receive an email uh, from us, but uh, we have short talks on deep learning and physics uh, next friday may 8th uh 1 p.m uh to uh 205 eastern uh eastern time and uh so hopefully uh, we will see you at that time this webinar will be recorded and shared with you and also you will get uh, a link to the registration for the uh, next webinar thank you everyone uh thank you sergey for a great uh, presentation very much appreciate it Stay in touch. Thank you for attention. Thank you. Bye. Bye.